Welcome to Fashmash Pioneers, the monthly speaker series where Rachel Arthur and I bring together the world's brightest minds shaping the future of fashion. We founded Fashmash nine years ago and our business mission remains as relevant now as it was back then. It is to encourage dialogue and sharing of ideas to shape the future of fashion. This evening, I am delighted to welcome a global authority in sustainability, best-selling author, entrepreneur, and pioneer in the truest sense of the word, John Elkington. Before I tell you a little more about him, I wanted to first of all thank our sponsor, Clavio. They are an e-commerce marketing company for brands of all types and sizes, from 111 Skin to Hummingbird Bakery and Fashmash. We have been with them now for over a year for our email marketing, and we have been delighted with the precision targeting that they offer, excellent customer service, and really brilliant insights. If you would like to give them a go, you can have a free trial at clavio.com forward slash Fashmash. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com forward slash Fashmash. So this evening, if you have been attending Fashmash talks for the last few years, there's one topic which just keeps coming to the fore, the tension between fashion's imperative to growth at, to grow and its sustainability goals. It is one that halts any possible progress. It is fashion's expansionist model focused on the bottom line that has driven this inequality and wrecked the ecosystem. Incremental changes on an individual brand level, which I know so many in our audience this evening will be really keen to make, are actually simply not going to enable us to hit the 2030 climate goals. So what will? That is what John and my co-founder Rachel are here to discuss this evening. It's a timely discussion, particularly as we approach the United Nations COP26 conference in Glasgow in just over two months time. To be upfront, John is not certain that the fashion sector, as one of the strongest examples of consumerism today, can ever reach a solution. But in conversation with Rachel tonight, they aim to explain what is needed and how we might be able to make the change. John's ethos is a new form of capitalism, regenerative in nature, as examined in his most recent book, Green Swans, The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism. It is one of his 20 books, and here is a little more about him. He was once named fourth in an international survey of global CSR leaders after Barack Obama, Al Gore, and Anita Roddick. He con coined terms we all now rely on in CSR, from people planet, prof people, planet Profit to the triple bottom line, a term that actually he recalled in 2018, and I know they'll be discussing that more this evening. He is the founder and chief pollinator, what a title, of Volans, which works with leaders to make sense of the emergent future to unlock the potential of their organization. John has helped create and incubate movements, including the B Team, the Dow Jones Sustainability Indexes, the Global Reporting Initiative, and B Lab UK. He was also a faculty member of the World Economic Forum from 2002 to 2008. He has addressed over a thousand conferences globally and has served on over 70 boards and over 70 advisory boards. Impressive doesn't even begin to capture this biography and we are so honored to welcome John this evening. Before I hand over the, to them, I just wanted to remind you about our charity donation. We have been delighted to see so many of you donate very generously this evening. Ever since the pandemic, we no longer charged for tickets to our talks, but instead we ask for a charity donation to a charity of the speaker's choice to thank them for their time and expertise, which they are sharing with us. This evening, we will be supporting Client Earth, an environmental charity using the law to create powerful change to protect life on Earth. 
please give what you can. If you haven't yet been able to donate, we still have the link live in Eventbrite. To date, these talks have donated to charities such as the Prince's Trust, Shelter, Saddle Black Sisters and Smart, Smartworks. And Fashmash also makes a donation each month. Right, a final couple of notices. Please do ask any questions via the Q&A button, or you can share your thoughts in the chat button, both of which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. You can also join the conversation on social media with our handle at Fashmash, or of course, the hashtag Fashmash. We will be having an audience Q&A at the end of the session, so please get your thinking caps on and share your questions. Right, Rachel and John, please turn on your video and um, welcome on stage. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rosanna. And hi, John. Thank you for being here. It is the most enormous honour to welcome you to talk with us this evening. It's a and great pleasure and, and, and wonderful to see you both. I must say Rosanna's in, introduction made me dizzy at some points, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's, and, that's and just just a public health warning. I mean, I, I uh, as Rosanna said, I, I'm really nervous about fashion. I think it can play a brilliant role, but so far it very largely hasn't. So um, over to you, Rachel. No, that's great. And that, that's, that's exactly where I wanted to, to start, actually. You know, this isn't this industry isn't something that you normally engage with relative to the climate crisis. You, you've said you've told me before you're very cynical about it. And, and, and other than you saying they're sort of nervous about it, it its abilities maybe you could just expand on that a little bit because I think it's a really important point for you know all of those in the audience to hear your perspective as to as to why you really why you really think that and what angle you come from on it well in, in many ways I think fashion is human signaling we 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 use it to signal status and and uh, in, in in multiple different dimensions and I think it's interesting at this particular moment where uh, as you said, the, the pandemic and lockdown and so on has changed all sorts of things, including the way you uh, do your, your meetings. And, and one of the things I think we're beginning to see is people exploring online environments. And, and science fiction has talked in the past about worlds where, virtual worlds, where people exert every sinew to earn their income to pay for online avatars and, and what they wear. You know, th there's something very fundamental in, in, in the human psyche which which sort of encourages almost forces us to signal in these sorts of ways so th th that's a generic concern but I, I also and I should just say that we work with companies primarily we talk about the named companies that we work with and not just company A and company B and and where things work well we talk about that and where they don't work so well we talk about that too and, and so in a way our clients have to sort of swallow hard and get used to that and so to your question about what makes me uneasy about fashion uh one of the very few occasions where we did uh engage with the fashion industry was with the paris-based uh, caring uh, fashion house which was then ppr um and it was just very striking how in in the the, the mindset of that particular company uh the sorts of things we were talking about csr sustainability all of this good stuff with stuff that had to be sort of managed from the headquarters, but really couldn't be allowed to go out and sort of disturb the thinking of the brand. So for example, at one point, the CEO of Gucci asked us whether we come and do a session uh, at their headquarters. And the answer was no, we couldn't leave Paris. We had to just do it there. And in the end, I, I, I resigned um, and the rest of a small advisory board resigned too. I don't say that with any pride. I just, it, it just, to me, underscored the difficulties of working um, with with organisations in the space. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you say that, and I think a lot of old fashioned behaviour still surrounds so much of this industry, and and but also you know a, a lot a lot of intention certainly for yeah. change, just in terms of those those attitudes. But I think you know I'm, I'm sure if we were to poll our audience today, we would see a really equal balance between cynicism and ambition, and indeed I presume you know often those two things can also live hand in hand. But an important one for us to to, to really think about. Um, just, just then to, to, to pivot to those wider companies that you work with, yeah. you've been known to call the time that we're in right now as the exponential decade. And you believe that business at large has a big role to play in aiding the changes that are needed. Can you talk to me a bit about why you think that is the case and, and what all it should 
encompass in terms of the role of the role of business within this transition? Yes, happily. And, and, and probably I'd just start by saying that when I started working with business now over uh, 40 years ago, uh, groups like Greenpeace thought that was not betrayal, but it was it was very strange. I mean, the only way really uh, for Greenpeace and people like them, and I love them to pieces still, um, uh, was to sort of pin them down with regulations and standards and just give them no freedom of manoeuvre because you couldn't trust them to do the right thing. And I've always felt that humans don't respond terribly well to being uh, handcuffed and tied down and so on. So if you really want to get the creative juices uh, uh, flowing, then you've really got to give people space and, and um, to find their feet and, and try new things. And yes, mistakes will be uh, made along the way. Now, if, if you're focusing on business, and as, as I've declared, I, I, that's largely where our efforts at finance uh, are directed, you cannot rule out government because government plays an incredible uh, important uh, steering function and all this guidance function, whether it chooses to do that effectively or not is another matter. But uh, so I, I don't think we're saying at any point, business can do this alone. Business has to work with civil society, business has to work with financial markets, business has to work with governments at every sort of different um, level. And to your point then, the question around the exponential decade, if you're working with business, uh, one of the things that happens every so often is you get a shift in the technologies that that, that business uh, uses, and you get a, a period where periods where people invest, and then periods where they disinvest. And what we have now is one of these relatively rare moments, which happens maybe every fifty to eighty years, um, where an old order, economic and actually geopolitical, starts to unravel. Uh, and that's happening all around us, and we can discuss that, but I mean, there are so many different signs of that. And a new one starts to sort of, or new ones start to self-assemble. Uh, and at the heart of all of this are a set of technologies, most conspicuously the internet that we're using uh, here and everything that goes along with that, that are intrinsically exponential. They enable us to do things uh, at a speed and a scale which was unimaginable uh, in the past. But it's not just the internet, it's things like synthetic biology uh, with agriculture and food and health. Uh, it's things like sort of um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, it's things like artificial intelligence. Uh, all of these things are sort of coming together at the same time. And that's relatively rare. Normally you have a cluster of maybe two, three, four technologies you know, that come together at the same time. This time we've just got crowds of these things coming together, which is both incredibly exciting, but also quite worrying because every time we have these new technologies, we have unintended consequences. So whether you're thinking about facial recognition or whatever, it's already clear that we're building futures that we really haven't properly thought uh, through. And fashion will be a really critical uh, driver in all of that, helping shape people's expectations, behaviours and so on. Yeah, indeed, that sort of role that it plays within within culture. And um, mm. lots of those points that you're referring to, you, you sort of brought together within your most recent book, Green Swans, mm. as Rosanna mentioned. Maybe you, for anyone that hasn't hasn't read it already, and I'm sure m much of our audience has, I, I did during lockdown last year and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what a green swan is and, and sort of the relevance of that compared to, to what you have just um, have just referenced. Yes, well, in, in, in a way, I'm, even if I have allergies to fashion, I'm a sort of a fashion conscious organism in the sense that I, I, I do have a sense of where the, the public mood is potentially shifting. So at different stages in my working life, I've, I've done things, for example, in the late 80s, uh, stitching together green and consumer yes. as a concept and, and publishing the Green Consumer Guide, which sold something like a million copies in uh, 18 months. And the triple bottom line, again, it's stitching you know the bottom line, which people recognize in business with this notion that you might have uh, several of them, not just... Um, uh, one. So I, I, I think we're at a, a point in all of this where there's a generational shift going on underpinning so much of this. I, I talked in a moment ago about technology, but you know when I started working with business, it was really hard to get inside companies. Uh, they saw people like me as, as sort of communist or, or you know, pretty problematic one way or another. No, because there are younger people at every level in business and the financial markets. Um, 
you know, it, it's a much more open conversation uh, that we're having. And people are actually frustrated because their personal values are much more than they once would have done now colliding with the corporate yeah. uh, world and the values that, that, that sort of companies uh, largely espouse. And, and, and Rosanna mentioned the B Corporation movement. I mean, I, I, I'll talk about the, the green swans happily, but for me, that is a green swan where, where entrepreneurs, founders of companies, owners of companies, managers of companies and businesses and so on, start to embrace a very different agenda and not just in a neutral way like quality, but what was embraced or health and safety, but they start to promote it, they start to champion it, and that's what's happening. So the idea of the green swan was relatively simple. Again, it was a riffing of uh, an existing uh, concepts. As you'll know, Nassim Nicholas Taleb came up with the notion of black swans. He did a book called The Black Swan in 2007, just ahead of um, the financial crash uh, of 2007-9. And, um, People thought he was an absolute genius, and in many ways he, he was and is. But what he was saying is that there are moments where uh, out of the blue, things affect us in ways that we could never have imagined, particularly or very few of us could have imagined. They have impacts that are off the scale. Uh, and these can be negative, they can be positive, but I've chosen to frame uh, the black swans as, as largely disruptive and in that sense for, for many people negative and green swans by contrast are exponential shifts uh, which take us broadly in the right direction now there are people who see that as let's develop climate solutions that are exponential those are therefore their green swans uh, but they don't think about the human rights side of all of that they don't think about the social and psychological elements i mean sort of the angst that younger people increasingly feel about uh, the future, they don't think about bribery and corruption, all of the different factors that sort of feed into these uh, stories. Um, so the Green Swans is just simply saying, and it, it's been quite funny because people around the world, I've had um, uh, emails from people in places like the Philippines or Indonesia saying, here's my new business card. I put, you know, I'm a green swan. Well, that's lovely. And I, I think it's, it's it, you know, I, I, I support the principle, but the idea of a green swan is it's a market shift. It's a societal shift. It's a political shift. It's not an individual company or a brand or, or, or whatever, but they can have green swan characteristics. Love that. That's really interesting. I, I, might, I might add that to my CV, John. <laughs> <laughs> really great. No, I, and I love the fact you refer to them, and I'm just going to quote here that um, to, to your point there around having to be sort of much more all encompassing, um, that uh, at their best, they are simultaneously environmentally restorative, socially just, and economically inclusive, which is very interesting in terms of just thinking about, you know, for this industry, that trifecta, which obviously we'll come to again in terms mm. of those three different areas that, that we need to think about. I wanted to turn a little bit, um, you know, just to, to, to continue this conversation about the sort of much wider market shifts. One of my focal points in my work, and, and indeed, as Rosanna mentioned in the introduction, is about how progress today is undermined constantly in the fashion industry because of the growth that we're otherwise seeing. So, you know, <clears throat> in other words, all sustainable efforts currently within this sector are being outplayed um, essentially constantly by overproduction, by overconsumption, by the economic system that we feed into, and of course, the constant quest for shareholder returns within the sort of, uh, you know, original model of what that looks like. No. And I would love your view on this in the context of upending that current capitalist model, or indeed by turning to regenerative capitalism, which is the focus otherwise of green swans. And maybe you can just explain that a little bit to us. Well, you know, I, I, Rachel, I sympathize enormously with people who think great growth is a bad idea. And if you're dealing with a model which is corrupted and broken, of course, it's a bad idea. But nature doesn't behave in that way. Growth is not a bad thing, particularly uh, in the natural uh, world. And I think, in a sense, we need to um, envision a future and work towards it where the materials we use and so on uh, can go back into the natural world and, and, and not cause problems or either into the natural world, into the biosphere and so on, uh, and that's where regeneration comes in, or into the sort of technosphere and uh, the circular uh, economy as we hopefully uh, continue to build that. And there have been people like Bill McDonough and Michael Brangart who've been talking about that for a very uh, long uh, time. Um, so I, 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 I've often, not been unpopular, but I've been suspect in a way because I, I, I'm pro-growth 
Uh, because I, I, I think one of the things that we are stuck with, whether we like it or not, is population growth. Now, there are books coming out now, there's one that came out recently called The Empty Earth, and it's starting to look at the way in which different countries around the world are starting to experience negative uh, population growth or decreases or whatever. And, 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 and that's partly aging, but then it's, it's partly just people stopping having uh, children for various uh, reasons. Now, but nonetheless, if you look at Nigeria, for example, that's going to go to a population, we're told, uh, equivalent to the United States by the middle of the century. I mean, it just huge trends of folk in demography. Now, the question is, do you simply say, you can't have growth, we had it, but you're not, you can't have it. Um, or do you somehow, and, and that actually primes a, 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 a barrel of uh, gunpowder, you're, you're gonna have explosive reactions to that. Or do you somehow say, we're gonna help you. And that could be addressed in the sort of form of, you know, we've developed a slave-based economy for a couple of hundred years, and, and people are asking for recompense for that. Mm -hmm. But if it if it was simple recompense to African countries, I've worked enough in Africa to know a lot of that just goes to bribery and corruption. So how, how do you do it in such a way that you genuinely help Africa uh, develop an economy that is uh, increasingly circular based on renewables and all, all the rest of it? Now, if, if you're going to do that, you're going to have ferocious growth in certain sectors of the economy. But it, it has to be matched by squeezing down of problematic sectors at the same time. So we've got to get rid of fossil fuels. We've got to get rid of uh, toxic chemicals and, 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 and so on. And I think fashion can play an important role in getting people to think about that. If, if designers and retailers and so on tell that story, and we recently did a, uh, quite a lot of work for Selfridges and, and, and looking at how that story is, is, is best uh, told. But so much as exactly of, of what you say of the, the growth model is not just growth, it's speed. And it's, it, it, it's not giving yourself time to think through properly what you're doing or what the consequences might be or how you might do things differently. And I think often p speed more than, than sheer scale is, is, is uh, a key part of that problem. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think this idea, is, as you've put far more articulately, but of, of good growth and bad growth, um, you know, and, and separating out those two things is highly applicable to this sector in terms of what we're seeing and also some of the potential progress um, that, that is that is being made, but is being, um, as I said, sort of outplayed otherwise by the, as I say, for well, it's, it's, what- It's funny, growth. Rachel, I, I was just thinking when you were saying that, that when we set up sustainability, the company in 1987, the logo, uh, for quite a long time, we call ourselves the Green Growth Company. And the, the, the visual component of the logo was a histogram, a, a sort of bar chart. And, and it started off with a black bar, and then gradually green came in from the bottom until finally it took over entirely. And the, the sixth bar uh, was totally green. And that broke frame. So up until that point, you were within a ceiling, limits to growth and planetary boundaries and so on. But it came a point where you broke through. Now, we haven't done that properly yet, but that's always been uh, my aspiration in a way. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And so then to bring that into what you're sort of seeing today again, you talk quite a lot, both in your work with the Tomorrow's Capitalism Inquiry and indeed in, in yeah. Green Swans, around this idea of getting stuck in a world of not just business as usual, but sustainability as usual, and lots of incremental progress, but no sort of big overarching ones outside of, as you said, there are these market shifts, but on a business level, um, I'd love us to sort of look at that a little bit and sort of some of the challenges there, because I think that's one of the things within the fashion sector, as I said at the beginning, there's such ambition here, there's such good intention, but in terms of collective progress, everything we're seeing is much more of that, yeah, sustainability as usual sort of route really now. So, um... When I think about fashion, I probably think disproportionately of the leading edge sort of catwalk world where, where a key part of the motivation seems to be to shock. So, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll go vegan one week and then I'll, I'll wear a business suit made out of sliced bacon the next. Um, <laughs> the, the idea is to, you know, hold, capture and hold people's attention. And that that's part of what makes it such a problematic um, 
uh, sector to uh, deal with. But I, I do feel exactly as you described, the generational shift is happening uh, quite powerfully in every sector. Now, it's certainly happening in, in, in wearers uh, of fashion. They want a, they want a, a good story to uh, tell. And I think the days when Catherine Hamnett and, and Stella McCartney and so on were these sort of iconic but lonely uh, and, and often sort of uh, severely misunderstood creatures on the seem to be on the edge of the system. I think I think that day is ending, yeah. but I still don't feel that the rhetoric uh, is translating at least so far into proper progress, uh, effective progress, timely progress, progress at scale into some of the areas that, that I think the, the fashion industry now meet, needs to move into. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with that more. I think there is, yeah, much wider um, set of set of people and ambitions there, but it's um, yeah, progress is still so, somewhat lacking. Um, do, do you think part of the challenge here is around how we sort of perceive value or what we consider success to be? Um, you know, and, and what does that look like in a green in a green growth world? I suppose. Well, I, I think you're beginning to see some of it in a way. Um, and, and one of the things that I've done since the same year that I first came up with the triple bottom line, which was 1994, is to track societal pressure waves. So there have been a series, going back to 1960 and then onwards, so far we're, we, we've gone through five of these pressure waves. And at each stage, a different agenda surfaces. And in between the waves, there are periods where just people um, switch off. Uh, some of them almost entirely, and then they forget. But what's interesting now, it's almost as though the tide has um, risen. It's not just a matter of waves, it, 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 the whole uh, environment has shifted, not around the world. It's not uniform. Uh, it's not uniform across even some of the more interesting societies, if you take into account uh, gender or particularly age. Uh, older people are still stuck in a, uh, an older uh, mindset or, or, or paradigm. Um, but I, I, I think that shift is happening. I think it's sh sh happening for many different reasons. And as to what, uh, you know, green fashion or sustainable fashion or inclusive, fair fashion or whatever label is put on it would look like in an appropriate world, we probably wouldn't have be having these sorts of conversations by that point because people would understand it. Their values would not. Uh, shape their behaviors and expectations and so on we are so far uh from that um so i you know i i can i can talk about aspiration i can go into sort of almost science fiction land um and talk about what's possible but w w we're stuck in a world where you know the basic human animal wants to display and 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 you know and that brings me just to the second point which is that Traditionally, if you were a billionaire or a multimillionaire, you would do that by having the latest Porsche or the biggest yacht or whatever. And now you see many of these people, and I, you know, I've worked with some of them, um, starting to switch into social entrepreneurship. And, 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 and Bill Gates would be an example of somebody who's not just focused on health, but on, on nuclear fusion and all sorts of different businesses, because he's trying to we, I think he's woken up. People do wake up at different points in their, their careers, but also he had such a, a, a horrific reputation. It was sort of trying to sort of reestablish some credibility. And traditionally, you know, a Carnegie or a Rockefeller would do that when they were dead with the foundation. Yeah. And now it's very interesting to see these wealthy people, super wealthy people, uh, and I think that that wealth divide issue is one of the most critical uh, and dangerous that we would face moving forward. And in, in a way, fashion plays into that wealth divide in, I think, very often a pernicious way. But, but to your question, I think we do see examples of people starting to display virtue and that virtue signaling being part of their status signaling. Whether that lasts, because these ways sort of come through and some uh, fade, uh, whether it becomes cultural and endemic over time remains to be seen. But I, I choose to leave, live in hope, and I choose to believe that the people, you know, on on this call and uh, in, uh, in this discussion, uh, will see over time how best to advance this agenda and this cause. I love how much of an optimist you are, John. Because when when you said 
about some of the billionaires, my mind immediately went to the space travel that we are yes. not seeing, the other extreme of exactly what, what you're saying. And, uh, you know, very interesting to think then in the context of the fashion industry that LVMH owner is uh, quite often jumping ahead of Bezos in terms of, you know, the, the, the world rich list. So a lot- One a lot very of quick thing, Rachel, I mean, just sorry, if I may, I mean, I, people have just in recent weeks because of what Jeff Bezos has done and Richard Branson and so on, Elon Musk and have been saying, these people are really not serious about sustainability because they're going off, they, they're giving up on uh, Earth uh, and they're going moving to New Zealand or Patagonia or Mars or whatever it is. Um, I, I've always, I, 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 I've worked briefly with Richard Branson, uh, Rosanna mentioned the, the, the B team. Um, and I, I've always said with, with what he's been doing with Virgin Galactic, the more billionaires and multimillionaires we can blast into space, and, and have come back, the better, because I've only met two astronauts in my entire life, but that whole cohort of men and women who left Earth and then look back, every single one of them went through almost a, a sort of like a religious conversion. So I think the more we can send people off into orbit, um, uh, the better. <laughs> Sorry to cut across, but it and just come a thought. Back. And, come back. <laughs> and, yeah, and um, largely come back, yes. <laughs> it, as I said, interesting, you know, you, you are the eternal optimist there. So maybe this is the beginning of, the, of a journey for many of them, which would which would be very wonderful to see. Um, let's pivot. You, we've mentioned the triple bottom line a couple of times. Um, mm. As you said, you coined this in 1994. Uh, many of our viewers will be very familiar with it. Um, you also recalled this in 2018. And I apologise because I know you have to tell this story every time you do a conversation <laughs> and I've asked you about it before. Um, but, but maybe it would be great if you, if you could explain why you did that and also how that fits into the regenerative model that we've that, that you've been talking about over the last couple of years. Yeah, well, I, I wish I could say I was deeply thoughtful and I had a, a long term game plan and so on. But sometimes what I do is based on an intuitive sense of something's not quite right, something's not quite working and so on. And I'd, I'd worked with a lot of the platforms that had embraced the triple bottom line. And some of them have been mentioned, the Global Reporting Initiative, the Dow Jones Sustainability Indexes, the B Lab World, B Corporations and so on. And I, I love what the B Corporation movement is doing. I, both my uh, most recent companies, businesses, sustainability and, and, and balance uh, um, uh, B Corporations. But what I saw in most of business was a game being played. And it's a game that you're also now seeing played with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which basically is involves people saying, we're in this business and, and, and what are we currently doing that plays into this field? Uh, so there are 17 cells, let's take the, 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 the goals, the UN goals, um, and we're covering off about five or six. Well, that's wonderful. And then let's, let, let, let's sort of put ticks in those six boxes and go back to sleep. And with the triple bottom line, what I very often saw was people saying, you know, economic, yeah, with economic value, we're, we're, we're creating a profit. So that's a tick on the financial side. I've always felt that this wasn't simply financial. It had to be economic, much broader. Uh, social. We provide jobs, we give people what they want. So that's a tick on the social side. Shame about the environment. Well, sometimes you see it the other way around. I mean, it's, 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 it's financial and environment, but it's not uh, social. Shame about the, the, the human rights story or whatever. Um, so I, I, I became concerned about that. And I, you know, I, I, it wasn't just a few cases, I was seeing it quite a lot. So that's why I sort of talked about sustainability as unusual. And I'd written for um, the Harvard Business Review before, but when I went to them and suggested a product recall of the triple bottom line, they said this was the first ever product recall of a management concept. And for anyone who doesn't know what a product recall is, if you, I used to work with Ford, for example, and for them, a product recall is a nightmare because you have to, you know, a class of vehicles, um, a year, a model, whatever, develops a, a gearbox misfunction or whatever. So you have to pull them all back and, 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 and repair them and then put them back. It's hideously expensive. So I, I use the product recall language just to sort of um, provoke in a way. So in a way, I, there is a sort of fashionable element. I am, I, I'm, I am doing this signaling in a sort of way as well. Uh, but what was really heartening was the number of um, really vicious <laughs> pushbacks was very, very limited. And this social media world, that, that's quite something. And I remember two uh, 
unrelated professors from Brazil were really incensed. But once I explained what we were trying to do, both of them pivoted and became champions of the idea. So to your question about how does that then link to regeneration? At the time, I didn't properly know. I knew something was amiss. I recalled uh, the um, triple bottom line and, and, and I said to people, and now we're gonna think about this. And, and, and could you give us a little bit of space and time to do that? And that's why we set up the Tomorrow's Capitalism Inquiry. Half a dozen companies came in, people like Unilever and uh, the Body Shop International and so on. And um, what we were trying to think through is, if not that, then what? And I, I think a lot of what we had done, and, and in the book I talk about, in the same way I used to talk about three Ps, people, planet, and profit or prosperity, um, three Rs. So the, the, the triple bottom line had been largely applied within a responsibility mindset. So people trying to be responsible in a world that was degenerating. So you only have to look at the climate, you need to look at um, loss of biodiversity and so on. There's absolutely no question that we live on a, a, on a degenerative uh, planet at the moment. Um, and, and people were being responsible and, 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 and being very proud of what they were doing and, and, and fine, but that wasn't gonna change the system. And in the, the middle R was resilience. So whether we like it or not, our economies, our societies and our communities, our politics, our biosphere, they're all wobbling. They're all showing acute signs of uh, stress uh, and distress. Uh, and, and a lot of people are scrambling to try and work, yeah, how, much, how many billions do we have to now spend in order to prop these things uh, up? And for me, the only way to uh, ensure long-term uh, resilience is to regenerate the systems are affected, whether they're economic, social, political, environmental, whatever. Um, so that, that's what got us into the regenerative space. Uh, I can talk about that more, but, but because there's some really interesting thinking and work now going on in that space, but I, I can't say that I got there in one jump. Yeah, no, absolutely fair enough. I mean, all of this is a process, isn't it? But uh, it it makes a lot of logical sense when you when you looking backwards out now. yeah <laughs> absolutely well I mean that's what that's what lives and storytelling is about but one of the things then you know maybe as a bit as a build on that in terms of some examples um or actually I'm gonna I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna ask it you the other way around because you said earlier about the fact that you you will very willingly talk about things that that have not been working as well yeah you spend as you as you've highlighted you spend so much time with leaders from all around the world which is an incredible position to be in. What do you want them to do that they are not doing yet that you would love to start seeing? Well, part of the answer to that was, I don't think there's one button in any business, any boardroom, any C-suite that you can press and then have everything working in the right direction. This is a mindset shift and it's a cultural shift. And, and that does not come easily, particularly when uh, the recruiting uh, that businesses get involved in tends to naturally select against some of the people that actually need to do uh, the, 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 the new thing. So if I go back 30 years, and when we were working with companies like Nova Nordisk in Denmark or, or Shell or Dow Chemical or whoever, our argument then would be, get the outside world in. We'll help you bring in. Don't just listen to us. I mean, we're, we can tell you what we think. But talk to the, you know, the, the, the people who are actually driving these tenders. So bring in Oxfam, bring in Greenpeace, but don't just do it on their own. Bring in a number of them at the same time yeah. and ha then have a conversation where you're seeing multiple facets of the same um, uh, story in a way. Now, that worked quite well for a, a time until it became formulaic. And then it was like the, the annual cocktail party. Um, companies would just do this as a matter of routine. And what started off at CEO level then declined down to lower levels uh, in the pecking order in, in, in business. So in the last sort of six, seven years, what I said to companies is, and this is particularly uh, uh, important as we sort of begin hopefully to come out of lockdown, um, get out more. Uh, in the sense that don't just invite the outside world into your boardroom under your own terms and, and, and so on. But, but go out and see people who are actually working on some of these uh, critical challenges, uh, working on the future, um, and, and including some of the technologies, business models, and so on, that will apply in your business. Go and see them. And there are, there are organizations like Leaders Quest and others who do learning journeys and so on. And I think when that happens, that can be transformative. 
But I'm also now sort of beginning to turn the wheel again and to say to many of these companies and leaders, talk to your own younger people. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things, that the signals that we're getting very powerfully from human resources, people, recruiters, and so on, is when big companies are going to uh, the talent they want to recruit, they're being asked some very tough, challenging questions. Why would I work with a business that is in decline or is going to hit the wall at some point? Um, and, and so I think uh, the, the top tier in businesses need to do a lot more to listen to their own younger people and not just to listen to them, but to sort of cultivate a culture over time where those younger voices are a very powerful influence on the thinking of the organization as a whole. So those are just some ways of thinking about it. There are, there are lots of other things. Yeah, another one is read a lot more science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> love that no and, and I and I really really agree with the yeah talking and listening to to younger people particularly I've been spending a lot of time with uh so-called intersectional activists and sort of some of the work that's been going on in that space particularly geared towards the fashion industry and their their insights and their insight is absolutely phenomenal yeah um uh, uh, to bring that down to more like localized level localized level sorry a lot of the the audience here will be from the industry i know a lot of them are actually not from fashion but work within the sustainability sector yeah. what what would your message be to them in terms of what, what is something that each of them can go and do step away from today to try and drive genuine change within the businesses that they work for when they don't necessarily have their leaders there's probably intention there but not fully on board with yeah. this with this journey well despite everything i've said today rachel i think one of the things that we can all uh, rely on it, it the time scale is questionable but these changes will happen they have to happen so you know at some stage they're going to uh, the, 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 they're going to become a reality. And the longer we leave action, the sharper the corrections are going to be when they actually happen. So back to the idea of the exponential decade, I think this is the decade in where so many birds come home, chickens or whatever, to, to roost. So um, I think it, we're in one of those periods. So two things that I would suggest to people. One is listen out for weak signals. We, we all live in an increasingly noisy environment. We're swamped in social media. And that's true of uh, even more true of people in boardrooms and, and, and C-suites and so on. But listen for weak signals because the human brain is very good at screening them out. Uh, and I think one of the things that has happened time and time again, where we, we, we don't do sort of um, emergency servicing of companies in trouble, although we, we are brought in sometimes when companies have had profound challenges, uh, and it's it's every time it's very clear that they ignored weak signals, all sorts of reasons for that. But 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 try and detect ahead of some of your colleagues what society is trying to say to your organization, your business, whatever, uh, and 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 amplify that a bit. Now it's very difficult to do that effectively without um, then swamping the ears of your and brains of your your your, your listeners or whatever. But that brings to me to a second point, which is the last way to be effective, or the least effective way to be effective uh, in, 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 in senior conversations is to be any sort of a missionary. Because one of the things I'm, I've always recognized is that when I was in the early days an environmentalist, people would slap the label environmentalist on you and then they'd discount 95% of what you said about any relevant issue. So I would have them believe instead that I was an engineer, an economist, an accountant, whatever it might be. Um, and I, I think that uh, it's, it's very easy to be missionary because once you wake up to the scale of what we've now got to do, it's both awe inspiring and it's exciting and it's, 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 it's actually quite, um, gobsmacking to use a sort of a, a, a clinical term and and it, it's very natural then to just try and cascade all of that onto other people but one of the things i find is most effective uh, is to ask questions to ask informed questions and and therefore not to sort of insult people's intelligence by saying you should be doing x y or z because i i, I say so but to say have you thought or what are you doing or how are you responding to x y or z and putting people not on the defensive, but just, you know, it's, it's, it's a genuine inquiry. I'm interested to know your answer. And it's very, it's very powerful if you get that right, because that forces people to think in a much more engaged way than if they're facing somebody who's got a, a dog collar on and is telling them that, uh, that they're on the, the, the path to hell. 
sorry about the religious reference but there we go <laughs> no it's a valid one and I think that that point there about asking more questions is certainly something all of us can do and certainly everyone is doing so tonight we've got loads and loads coming in so let's turn to those before we do just quickly one 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 note to end on from me yeah um, as we've we've heard from you and we've referenced already, you are an optimist at heart. What is your hope for the future within this exponential decade that we're currently in? If you had to to summarize it in, in one sentence. Well, I, let, let me I, I mentioned science fiction a moment ago, and that wasn't an accident. I've, I've read science fiction since the 60s, and but it goes in waves. There are times when it's really interesting and times when I find it sort of almost deadly boring. And now yeah. is one of those times where it's really, really interesting. And particularly, for example, some of the, the, the Chinese science fiction authors are absolutely um, riveting because you start to see a very different cultural consciousness coming up mm. there. But there's a book, if I had to re recommend one book, to any leader and i've done this and a number of them started to read it as a result it's a it's a, it's a big book uh, it's the ministry for the future by kim stanley robinson so some of them you will have heard of it and hopefully none of you will have read it uh, the reason why i put it out there is that the the, the 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 question he sets himself is what would it take to get this world of ours onto a trajectory that made climate sense that w where we as a species really started to deal with that effectively. Um, and it's interesting that the, the denouement, the sort of the, the conclusion of the book, so this is COP26 uh, this year, their, their, their annual, uh, and it, the denouement is in uh, COP54, so it's sometime uh, in the future. And, and it's, it's fascinating. And one of the interesting things, one of the things I find most interesting about the book is that it doesn't simply say, we're gonna get there via logic. And at some point, there is a there is a moment where people start to say, these fossil fuel people are not getting out of the way fast enough. Maybe we should have a deniable dark art squad taking them out. And that's left as a dangling as a question, but you you you're left to conclude that's begun to happen. This is a war. I am an optimist, but I actually think this is a collision between very different ways about thinking about our world and our future. And the way that we think that's stuff through is is through conflict it very often goes to war hopefully this time it won't but i think it will um read the book the ministry for the future excellent well that actually does answer one of the questions that come, that has come in already so let me um invite rosanna back and she can um run through the rest of these questions with you now wonderful Hi, thank you both so much. Um, we've got lots of questions. I'm going to crack straight on. First of all, the first question that came in is, uh, it has disappeared. There we go. It's from Nathan Slater. You've spoken about the perception on the need for growth due to population growth and the associated requirements that brings that, that that brings, as well as the need to regenerate and rejuvenate the systems we have. But isn't our climate crisis a symptom of current consumer capitalist model? Yes, Nathan, it is. Um, and and uh, I, I, if I, 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 people in North um, East America and New England and places say you can't get wherever you want to go from here. And, you know, I wouldn't choose to start where our species has got itself. Um, because in some ways it looks impossible, doesn't it? But one of the things I've been saying uh, with increasing um, uh, frequency is that so in, for so much of my life, um, people have been telling me what people like me want to achieve is impossible. It's impossible for all sorts of reasons. It's physically, scientifically, economically, whatever, politically uh, impossible. But it's been very, very interesting to see how what was once seen to be impossible. Think about COVID-19 and the mobilization of trillions of euros or dollars or whatever. Impossible, but it happened. Uh, so what was once seen to be impossible can become um, possible over time. And I think with climate solutions, that's very much now in, in, in the process of, ha of happening. I think with biodiversity, the solutions, and this is where we get into regeneration proper, are not happening as fast as they need to, clearly. Uh, but then once you get through that possibility phase, you get to a period where people say, well, it's inevitable, of course it's going to happen. And why didn't, why, you know, I could have told you that decades ago. Well, they didn't, they didn't believe it. But I, I think we're going through that 
transition at the same time. And within 10 to 15 years, you're going to have people saying things were inevitable and they weren't. They got We got there through collective willpower and, and, and so on. And I think the signaling function of fashion, which I keep coming back to, is absolutely crucial because people do pay attention, at least in subliminal ways and in peripheral vision, to what fashion is 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 um, uh, signaling. So I'm, I, 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 I think this sector has an immensely important uh, role to play, but still to be realized. But yes, population is a bugger. I mean, if I could, if I could manage that back, uh, I, I would, uh, but I can't. So I think we're going to have to work with it. Uh, from Heather Alien, what made you choose Client Earth as your charity of choice? Hmm. Well, I have I, I actually have antibodies to uh, lawyers uh, in the sense that I've been sued by uh, McDonald's. I've been uh, sued by um, a UK chemical company, ICI, three different businesses with an ICI. They're now extinct. Um, uh, so I, I, lawyers, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly nervous about. But um, on the other hand, we have used lawyers ourselves and they can be interesting organisms. And in this particular case, Client Earth are one of the most effective uh, non-governmental organizations I know of. And basically what they're doing is they've concluded we've got to shut down the fossil fuel industry. And that includes shutting down power plants. And I think uh, I, I, they've shut down hundreds and hundreds of power plants in Europe. They're now pivoting to some degree to Asia where you know coal is still burnt on, in prodigious quantities. And basically their model is to use every means available from the law as it is to squeeze these um, forms of development uh, and also to lobby for new laws which would actually make uh, developing uh, degenerative industries like those uh, illegal. So th that's why I, I, I just, you know, it's 200 people in total, I think, but they've had a bigger impact than um, NGOs sort of 10, 15, 20 times their size. That's impressive. Um, from Kay Carmichael, what role do you think governments have to play in driving sustainability in the fashion industry? Kate, I think it, it, they, they have an absolutely central role to play, but, but, they, but they duck it so often. Um, and, and part of the reason they duck it is because business leaders in covertly behind the scenes lobby not to have uh, rules, standards and particularly regulations that force them to do certain things. But over time, in the same way that our genetic makeup, our genome, dictates certain things are done inside our bodies and certain things are not done. And you know, if they, if they are done, sometimes those trigger cancers or tumors or whatever it might be. It's the same with our economies. And we need to regulate the materials we use, the chemicals we use, the way in which um, uh, uh, post-use uh, products are disposed of. And, and you know, we only need to look at what's happened with the world ocean, uh, where you know, the, the, the plastic content of the ocean now is just off the scale. And, and nobody set out to do that. They didn't set out to create antibiotic resistance. They didn't set out to create space debris. They didn't set out to uh, create the obesity pandemic that's spreading around the world with all the chronic diseases, diabetes, and so on, that link to that. Governments have a role in trying to head off those sort of unintended consequences. And in recent decades, I was about to say years, but in recent decades, governments have uh, largely abdicated uh, that role. And I think that is a, 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 a cardinal error. We've got to have um, effective government, not just simply stopping things happening, but, but in, uh, promoting thing, the good things that are happening. So you know, minimum, have a, a, a government-backed uh, incentive scheme that, that um, incents designers to do the right thing in this sort of space. But at the same time, hack the, the mal malefactors, the bad ones off at the ankles. I, I, I don't want to, to sound too dramatic, but unless we signal very, very clearly that certain forms of behavior are totally unacceptable, those forms of behavior will continue. Mm -hmm. So we've got to punish and penalize, I'm afraid. Very well put. Um, Vivian Austin asked about your recommended science fiction, but we have the perfect answer here in, in the form of the Ministry for the well, Future. The, the, let, let me say... Trouble? <laughs> Let me say one other thing. Um, many, many years ago, I stalked, that's too strong a word, but uh, Frank Herbert, who wrote the novel Dune, 
I was set that book when I was at university in the late 60s. And afterwards, I, I, I eventually tracked him down. We had the most extraordinary uh, conversation. And some of you will know his, his long awaited um, the film oh. of that novel mm -hmm. comes out in October, I think October the 23rd. And I'm not saying that it, it will answer the questions that we're raising today. Through Frank's consciousness and writing, there was always an ecological and to some degree social and cultural component that was very strong. So alongside the Kim Stanley Robinson canon or you know, range of books, I'd, I'd, I'd say Frank Herbert would be in the mix very strongly for me as well. Thank you. Uh, finally, because we have got another couple of questions, but I just don't think we're going to have time. So uh, final question, Harini Manivanan. What are your thoughts on the role of nature-based solutions in reaching regenerative capitalism? Irene, I think they're absolutely critically important. And, and one of the reasons why I'm so excited about them and they're absolutely crucial in the, the regenerative economy is that you're, you're, you're getting, um, uh, it, it is genuinely triple value. Or it's a triple win in the sense that you are addressing climate change, you're addressing biodiversity loss, you're providing new forms of employment, you're, you're providing health through healthy environments, including sort of improving, um, you know, urban tree planting uh, is, is one way of radically cleaning up um, uh, city air. And, you know, you think about why are so many plane trees uh, in cities, uh, particularly in, in, in London where I live, and so the Victorians put them there because they, they filtered the air and the Victorians knew that. We've got to do a lot more on the nature-based uh, solutions front. And I think it's as an important a sector as IT was back 30 years ago. And it has the potential to explode uh, out into the wider world, go exponential in a very similar way. Thank you very much. And thank you for everybody's questions. I'm sorry we couldn't quite get around to them all, but do email us if you have anything specific to ask John, um, and I'm sure we can help. Uh, before I hand Rosanna, you... Rosanna, sorry, uh, just um, my email is john at volance.com. If anyone wants to send a, a, um, a question direct, I, I answer every uh, email, but um, sorry, That'd Rosanna. Better. Can... Thank you. That's brilliant. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, john at volance.com, right? Yeah. Great. Um, so before I hand back to Rachel for a bit of a lighthearted, quick fire round to finish, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for attending. Thank you very much to our sponsor, Clavio. Thank you for our donations. And as you as I said, if you would still like to donate to Client Earth, that is still open on Eventbrite. Um, and do stay tuned for news of our next speaker later this month. Um, John, thank you so much. It really has been scintillating. And I will hand you back over to Rachel now. Thank you, Rosanna. Lovely. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Yeah, and I can vouch for the fact that John does indeed reply to every email, hence why we have you here tonight. So <laughs> thank you, John, for doing so. Um, and Vivian, yes, uh, Rosanna has just posted the uh, email address there for you. Um, so a quick fire round to end. As I mentioned, this is just our lighthearted way of finishing. So I'm going to say two words and you have to just choose which of the two um, is your preference in it all. Um, some of them very obvious, but let's see how we get on. OK, ready? I think maybe, yes. <laughs> okay, first one's very obvious. Black swans or green swans? Green swans. Profit or purpose? A mixture of the two. <laughs> Fine. Uh, because I know you've spent a lot of time in both places. London or Silicon Valley? Oh, God. Uh, that's really problematic. Uh, I love Silicon Valley, but I adore London, and I've, I've lived in it since 1970, so I'm London on balance if I had to choose. Fair. Street protests or desk activism? I've, I've gone out on some of the uh, climate change marches, the school uh, children ones, and, and I, I think they're incredibly important because they help people cut their teeth. But I equally, and one of the things that Planet Earth is doing is that sort of desk-based activism. I'd find it really hard to choose between those because I think the first creates the conditions in which the second can be more effective. So let me duck that question, if I may. <laughs> totally fair. Well, if you're a writer of 20 books, I think you're, you're, you're allowed to, to lean towards the latter, certainly. But I totally appreciate your perspective there. Um, Glasgow in real life or Glasgow online? What will you be doing this November? 
Well, it's funny because um, I've not been to any of the previous COP meetings um, uh, by choice. Um, I've gone to the business ones where they existed, but this time we're taking our entire team there because it's on our local patch. I mean, our entire team is probably 10 people, um, but um, I will be there. Uh, and partly because of some invitations to take part in events, but partly just in the quest for serendipity. So, um, I, but I suspect we'll be there physically and 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 virtually at the same time. Yeah. Serendipity, that word, that one thing we've all been missing for the past 18 months, certainly. Yeah. Um, well, we're doing lots of fashion things there, so we may indeed rope you in in that sense. Fabulous. One final one, 2021 or 2031? 2031, without any question. And if we could go to 2041, when I would be in my 90s, I'd be even happier. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that indeed. Um, yeah, you, you had to say that given your penchant for, for science fiction. <laughs> John, thank you so much for being here. I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you said yes. And for all of the insight you shared, I've, I've learned so much. And I'm sure everybody else listening has as well. Um, hugely appreciate your time and your expertise. Well, thank you, uh, Rachel, to you and Rosanna. And, and uh, it's been a learning curve. And I, I, one of the things about this whole field is that the learning curve, curve never stops. In fact, if anything, it's sort of bending upwards the whole time. But I love that. And, and clearly a lot more to learn about your uh, world as well. So well, thank you. Until COP26, if not before. Indeed. Thank you for bringing your optimism to us tonight, because I think that's all certainly something that is needed all round. So we really appreciate it.